and different uh, and different um, elastic um, membranes that they they are interacting, they are pushed and they are interacting with each other. So that straight piece means the F the F one and the F two agree along there. Okay, they cannot agree because one is pushed up and one is pushed down. It turns out that in the end, in magnitude, in magnitude. Is it like wind? Is it like wind or what? F is like wind up and wind down, like wind. No, I think pressure. I, pressure. Yeah, pressure. Yeah. So I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I I have two balloons yeah. and they are they are pushed against each other. Yes. Okay. And sort of, yeah, the F would represent the, pressure, the force. The pressure is equal along that line. Well, on this line, sort of, is, is the average, right? So, so on this one, on, on the middle piece, the, what, what I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I have a common piece, but the, the force, the force acting on this piece is the average of the two forces. Oh. Yeah. I mean, that's what comes out from the, let's say, fr from the energy. Yeah, the, I mean, here we try to minimize an energy with the energy of the first membrane plus the energy of the second membrane. Yeah, F1 and F2 represent these forces. And you have this constraint that the membranes cannot penetrate. And then when you, when you do the calculations is essentially in the region where U1 separates from U2, you're going to satisfy that the Laplace of U1 is equal to F1. So I'm going to have like this, the Laplace of U1 is equal to F1 in the region and Laplace of U2 is equal to F2 in the region where U1 is strictly bigger than U2. Yeah, I have these two things. In the region where U1 is equal to U2, the two functions are equal, then the Laplace of U1 is equal to Laplace of U2 is equal to the average F1 plus F2 sorry, over 2. And then again, the transition between the two, the two regions has to be done in a C1 fashion. I, I cannot make angles at these points. Yeah? These two points represent the free boundary. Yeah? As, as I move the boundary data, these points are going to move back and forth. Yeah? Okay, so now these are the problems that uh, I want to discuss. Let's see, so I'm going to start with the obstacle problem and what sort of questions I'm interested. So I'm mostly interested in the regularity of the free boundary, which is the regularity of this piece of membrane that sits on, on the table. Yeah? Okay, so I, I take the simplest situation. The simplest situation is I want to have constant right hand side. So I forget about the F, F is always one. In this particular case, I have a straight table. Uh, so you, know, you, you think you have gravity and at some point I get some region here where U rests. Uh, there is an energy associated to this problem. You want to minimize this energy under this constraint. There is a natural scaling. So the scaling is that if you do quadratic scaling, as you, as you look at this equation, the equation remains invariant. So this is the natural scaling of the equation. Yeah? Okay, so in general, what you want to do, you want to do um, um, you want to do a blow-up argument. If you want to understand very what happens near a point on the free boundary, you just want to zoom the image more and more and more and end up with a global solution. Yeah? So this is the zooming, the scaling in the zooming. Yeah, dilate space like R, but quadratic rescaling. In, in my notation, the free boundary, which is the, most, the, the thing that I'm mostly interested in, is denoted by gamma u. Yeah? It's the boundary of, of, of this of this region. So before you do the before you do the worry about the free boundary, first you, you want to say how how smooth is the function u, how well behaved is, and it turns out that u is uh, behaves as you would expect. You cannot have continuous second derivatives because the Laplace is discontinuous, but the second derivatives are bounded and you have some sort of quadratic behavior of you near a free boundary point, so then you can really do a blow-up analysis. So it means you, you just want to blow up and end up with, with a global solution. 
There is also something called vice monotonicity formula, which has the same role as the monotonicity formula for the minimal surface equation. Yeah. So that, that allows you to say that at the end, after a blow up, the limit is going to be homogeneous. Yeah. So, so in the end, you end up that up to subsequences, if I look closer and closer, and up, up to subsequences, I can end up with a global solution that I call U bar. And this is homogeneous of degree to solution with, in which zero is still a free boundary point. So what can you say about such global solutions? Well, you look first in 1D, so in 1D there are two such solutions. One is the quadratic on the right and zero to the left. Yeah? This is exactly if I would blow up in 1D near a point where, my, near a point where, the, where the membrane, yeah? so if, I, if I'm in 1D and I would look at this picture and I would blow up near this point, I would end up, or sorry, near this point, no, near this point, then I would end up exactly with this uh, profile. There is also the one, that, the fully quadratic one, and this you can try to think if I have a membrane that initially sits above the table, yeah, this is the membrane that sits above the table, and then I sort of s s drop it down, there is a first time in which this membrane is going to touch the table, and s if I zoom near this point, I'm going to end up with a full quadratic. Yeah? These are the two situations in 1D. If I try to, un to understand them in n dimension, this one, you, you simply say, well, it's the same thing, I extend it trivially in, in n dimension. Yeah? So I would have a half plane to the right and a uh, to the left and a quadratic to the right. These ones, they generalize to more quadratic polynomials. So essentially any quadratic polynomial that is non-negative and has Laplace 1, yeah, so any quad purely quadratic polynomial that is positive with, with uh, Laplace 1 would, uh, would create such a point. Yeah? And, okay, so it turned, in, in n dimensions, these are the only possibilities. Either I'm going to see this after a blow up, or this, or, or a full quadratic polynomial after blow up. Yeah. Okay, and this is, a, so, so this is one of the few problems in which all the blow ups can be, can be um, classified. In all, in all the dimensions, yeah? In, in most problems you're going to reach some dimension in which you're going to have some different uh, configuration, possible different configuration. Not in the obstacle problem. And why do you call the first case a regular point and why do you call the same case a single point? Yes, yeah. So, so actually, yeah. so these are sort of regular points. These are regular points in which I really expect to see. So now if I pay attention to the free boundary, I would expect, like, like even in this case, right? Uh, yes, uh, so this point is very unstable, right? If, if I look at the quadratic, this is very unstable. If I lift it up a little bit, it disappears. If I push it down, the point fattens into a segment, yeah? While this one is very stable, even if I move the, the boundary data, I only expect still to see a segment and this point just to move left and right, yeah? So, so this one, can fatten or disappear, while well, this one is much more stable. So, so whenever I see the first blow up, which I expect to see most of the time this one, let's say, generically I would expect to see this one, these are regular points and I expect better regularity properties of the, of the interface, of the free boundary, these ones are more delicate and, and we'll see in a second, yeah? So what I expect, every, whenever I blow up and I end up with this profile at a point, I call that point a regular point, and every time I end up with some sort of parab parabola, full parabola in the whole space, I call it singular. What I give you here on top is some uh, how, uh, picture of how the free boundary can look. Yeah? So you can have sort of a coincidence set that looks like this, and then the boundary of this set would be mostly made of regular points here with blue, but I would also expect maybe some possible singular points that are cusp-like. Yeah? 
How, how can you obtain such a coincidence region? Yeah? If you think about, you take like a, a round wire and a membrane, yeah? and what you're, what you're going to see on the floor, you're going to see like a convex set. Imagine that you start pulling your wire just from two sides to infinity. Yeah? Then actually your coincidence set, right? your coincidence set goes from being like this, it's going to start shrinking more and more, sort of like in this, in this, and at some point it's going to, to have a first time when it's going to, to shrink, it's going to change topology. Yeah? At this point, this, this would be singular points, like in this picture, right? Like these points can occur. So there are these cusp-like points that are singular points. What you can say, you can say the following, you can say that if you, if you end up in the regular part, then really the free boundary is very nice and an analytic surface. And if you end up with a blow up like in the singular case, then you can say that the zero set is cusp-like. So you can really be trapped between two hyperplanes that are very close to each other relative to the scale you are looking at. Yes? So if all the data is uh, analytic, Yes. Is the regular part OBC infinity or can it be analytic? It's analytic, I, I didn't write. So, so you even don't need the, the data to be analytic. So you can, you can show that locally the free boundary is analytic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, how about this singular set? What can you say about the singular set? So, so Caffarelli obtained this result in, in the late 70s. Now, more recently, much, much better information uh, we have about the singular part of the, of the free boundary. This has to do with the, I mean, regularity for the singular part of the free boundary has to do with the uniqueness of blow-up profiles. Yeah? So whenever you blow up, you only know that up to a sequence you converge to one of these polynomials. Can you show that that is unique? If you manage to show that the the blow-up limit is unique, then you would prove that this gamma singular belongs to a C1 submanifold. Yeah, if you, if you manage to prove uniqueness. So what, what it turns out that the singular part of gamma can be broken into n different sets, sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma n minus 1. What are this, this strata of the singular part? So the, van the quadratic polynomial that you, you end up in the limit might vanish at a single point, yeah? it might, might be everywhere positive and just vanish at the origin. Then you expect those points to belong here to sigma zero and to be discrete, just to see them from time to time. Then if the blob polynomial vanishes on a line, then you expect that your singular set is included in a one-dimensional line. Yeah? I mean, maybe it's not the full dimensional line, but at least has to lie, not the, uh, more than one, one dimensional line, and so on, right? So, so you can go all the way to sigma n minus one, which means that you take sigma n minus one, means that you take actually the quadratic polynomial in 1D and you extend it trivially in the remaining n minus one variable, yeah? Then the vanishing order has dimension n minus one of, of the zero set. So you can try to think of these things being the dimensions of the vanishing sets of the, of the quadratic polynomials. Yeah? So the, one can obtain regularity for gamma singular in the sense that you can say that sigma k is included in a C1 submanifold of dimension k. Yeah? So they are nicely aligned. This was done by, so, so some results about regularity for gamma singular, Sakai in 2D using complex analysis uh, obtained this result, then Caffarelli proved, proved the uniqueness of the blow-ups in general dimension through, by using a monotonicity formula known as alt caffarelli friedman monotonicity formula. Uh, then Mono had the monotonicity formula that proved the uniqueness of the blow-up profiles in, in a different way. So essentially Monod realized that if you look 
at the average over a ball of radius r of u minus any quadratic polynomial p. If you look at this, this thing has to always be decreasing with r. So this is mono monotonistic formula. And this essentially tells you that if you are close enough to a given polynomial p at the ball r, then you, you cannot, this polynomial p cannot rotate, the approximating polynomial p that approximates your solution cannot rotate with the radius r. Yeah? So if you are close enough at a given stage to, to a fixed polynomial p, even later on, you have to be close enough to that particular polynomial p. That would prove the uniqueness of Blob's profile. And then more recently, there were some works, so there are some works. One is in, by Colombo, Spalaura, and Velichkov, in which they use Weiss monotonistic formula and an epiperimetric inequality to prove, okay, so, so, so what can you do? Up to, up to here, all you know is that this singular sigma k's are, I mean, you just get uniqueness of the blow-ups, and that would tell you that the sigma k's are included in C1 submanifolds. If you can get a rate of convergence of how fast you are converging to the blow-up polynomial, then you can get more information on the regularity of sigma k. Yeah? And Colombo, Spalor, and Velishko show that this C1 can be improved to C1 log. Seems like a very small improvement, right? You just go from C1 to C1 log. And Figali and Serra in 2017, they actually show that a more precise result, and maybe I'll explain a bit better, that you cannot actually get better than C1 log for sigma 0, sigma 1, and so on up to sigma n minus 2, but this sigma n minus 1, you get a C1 alpha uh, regularity. So actually, if you belong, if the point x belongs to this, to the higher stratum, sigma n minus 1, then you have a better rate of convergence to the, to the limiting pol quadratic polynomial at the point. Yeah? While this is not valid for the other stratum. And Figali and Serra used the Almgren frequency formula, like again, another monotonicity formula, and, and these, are, these have to do with the thin obstacle problem. I'll, I'll explain in a second the relationship between the obstacle problem and the thin obstacle problem. Uh, okay, I also have a result with Hu Yu in which he proved essentially this result with the precise C1 alpha for the highest uh, stratum and C1 log for the lower stratum for fully nonlinear operators. What's different about our proof is that we don't have to use monotonicity formulas. Yeah? So we, we sort of can get around monotonicity formulas and can get this result for, uh, for general uh, for general obstacle problems in which instead of dealing with Laplace, we can put here even a nonlinear operator. Okay, so these are the results about the regularity for the obstacle problem. This is also, the, the obstacle problem has something to do with the Stefan problem. So let me, let me the, the obstacle problem sounds very simple. You just have a membrane sitting on top of, a, of an obstacle. There's in, in various hidden forms. So one, one such place where it appears is the Stefan problem. The Stefan problem says that it describes how ice melts in a liquid. Yeah? So you can think you have water and here ice and theta represents the theta of Tx represents the temperature of uh, at, at point x and time t. And when theta is positive, that's the water region where theta is equal to zero is the ice region. Yeah? So the water is going to melt the ice. And the way the temperature evolves, you have the heat equation in the water region. But the way the, the ice is pushed inside, the velocity of the interface is given by the gradient of the temperature, right? So if, if you think here on the right, you, you look at the, the temperature at the given time t, this point is going to be pushed to the right according to the slope that theta has at the interface. Yeah? So, so the, the, the interface is evolving 
and the, the equation in the positivity set is the heat equation. Sometimes, I mean, if you, if you want to write what the velocity is in terms of the function theta is theta t divided by the gradient of u. So actually, this second, the, 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 the condition on, on the free boundary gamma that tells you how gamma is moving, it can be written also in this term, that theta sub t is the gradient of theta squared on the interface. What does this have to do with the obstacle problem? So this is a, there is a transformation observed by Duvaux and Bayoki, which said if I, if I want to look in the distributional sense, what is the heat operator for theta, so in the whole region, also on the zero region, it turns out that is just, so, so now gamma is an interface in space-time. Yeah? So it turns out that the distributional uh, in the heat equation in the distributional sense is simply the projection of gamma in the x coordinate. Yeah? If I take nu sub t, nu is the normal to the interface in space time, nu sub t is the time component of nu, and this nu sub t times the measure of gamma is nothing but the projection of gamma onto the, onto the x variable. So this in fact tells you that if I start translating the solution up and integrating this measure, what I get on the right hand side, I'm going to get a constant. Yeah? So, so if, you, if you just integrate theta, so if you look at a new variable u of x t, which is integral from 0 to t of theta of x s ds, then actually what I'm going to get, I'm going to get the heat equation when I integrate this, but when I integrate the right hand side, I'm just going to get one on top of the interface. So actually you obtain a parabolic obstacle problem. Yeah? It's an obstacle problem, but I mean in space time, but instead of dealing with the Laplace equation, we deal with the heat equation. Yeah? So the heat equation is going to lift theta from an obstacle. Yeah? So Figal and Serra and Rossoton, using their results from the, from the elliptic case of the obstacle problem, they, they did the parabolic version, which is much more involved, but essentially they were able to prove a partial regularity result for the Stefan problem and show that for each slice, not for almost every time slice t in the physical dimension in R3, I was, I was I forgot to write here that we are in the three-dimensional space, then the interface is supposed to be smooth for almost every time. Yeah? So you think about this ice melting, of course you're going to have singularities. Yeah? If you have some piece of ice melting, at some point the ice is going to break and you're going to have singular points. They show that the time when you're going to see a singularity is of measure zero, in fact, of, of Hausdorff dimension one half, to be more precise. But all this, let's say, the, 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 the main technique come from dealing with the obstacle problem and trying to understand the convergence of the solution at the limiting polynomial as r tends to zero, getting a very good rate of convergence uh, at, at, sorry, at a singular point. Yeah. Okay, so now let me say some things about the thin obstacle problem. Yeah? Thin obstacle problem, I, I mentioned it already before, there is this, uh, the, the, the difference now is that the obstacle is lower dimensional, but what is, we no longer have to think that we have a force. So, so like in, in the classical obstacle problem, by maximum principle, if you have no force, if your boundary data is positive, then your, your surface would be above zero, would never touch zero. So, so in the classical obstacle problem, to have a free boundary, you have to push it down, you have to put some force to get a coincidence region, right? In this one, because you are missing a direction, your boundary data can already go down, right? Like, like in this picture. If your boundary data can go below zero on the, on the sides of this thing and can push the membrane, you can have a trivial, a, a, a non-trivial coincidence set without any force assumption, yeah? So, 
the thin obstacle problem makes sense with no force. But also what is, what is harder in the thin obstacle problem is that in fact, if you have a solution U, any rescaling of U, any homogeneous rescaling of U would still solve the obstacle problem. So there is no longer, right, that the classical obstacle problem looks like this, Laplace of U is equal to one where U is positive and zero where U is zero, yeah? There is a quadratic rescaling for this, yeah? The thin obstacle problem is Laplace of U is equal to zero in the set with U is positive and Xn is different than zero, right? Something like this. And Laplace of U is less than or equal to zero. So the right hand side, there is no more, I mean the right hand side is zero, there is no, no necessarily quadratic rescaling. Any rescaling would work for the thin obstacle problem. Yeah? So then which, which rescaling is the natural one? Yeah? like around these points. So what, what Atanasopoulos, Caffarelli and Salsa in, in 2006, they realized that in the thin obstacle problem you can sort of treat it by looking at the Almgren frequency formula. Almgren frequency formula usually applies for harmonic functions. You have this quantity R uh, the integral of grain of u squared in BR div divided by the, by the integral of u on the boundary of BR. If, if u were a homogeneous harmonic function, this thing would always be constant and would be precisely the homogeneity of the function. Yeah? What Almgren frequency formula tells you, it tells you that this quantity is in fact, as you zoom in, a point is decaying. Yeah? So you can get you can get a bound on the frequency, on, on the homogeneity of your harmonic polynomial at a point through an integral at scale one. Yeah. This, this is also used in unique continuation uh, uh, questions. Yeah. So what Atanatsopoulos, Kaffer and Salsa realized that this frequency formula applies pretty well in the thin obstacle problem. The function is no longer harmonic. However, on xn equal to zero, either u vanishes, right? Either u vanishes here, or the derivative vanishes. Yeah, so u times u nu is always zero on xn equal to zero. And that's good enough to, to realize that this frequency still remains monotone. And this quantity should tell you what is the homogeneity? If you, if you take a point and you look at this quantity and you, and you look to what it converges to zero, it should tell you precisely the value of beta that you have to use in a blow-up argument to end up with something non-trivial. Yeah? So in the thin obstacle problem, this quantity lambda that would be the, the limit of this of this quantity is r tends to zero, right? Lambda, which is f of zero plus, this is, not, this is referred to as the frequency. And then if you go into dimensions, say what are the possible frequencies into dimensions? And you, you end up with integers. So this, let's say, this one corresponds still to a harmonic polynomial. Like if I look at x1 squared minus x2 squared, it would still be positive on the x1 axis, yeah? So this, so this would simply be harmonic polynomials that are still positive in xn equal to zero, or, or x1 equal to zero. These ones are still harmonic polynomials of odd degree that vanish on half a plane. But there are also this half, let's say, this frequencies that correspond to the values 3 halves, 7 half, 11 halves, which are like real part of z to the 3 half, the real part of z to the 7 half, and so on. So these are the profiles that in fact I would see at this point. Yeah? So if I, if I am to blow up near such a point, what I'm supposed to see, I'm supposed to see a harmonic function homogeneous of degree 3 half that vanishes on this segment, but is harmonic everywhere around. Yeah. And that's why sort of the optimal regularity is given by the 3 half power. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so sort of the least frequency you can have at a free boundary point is 3 half. These are the most stable ones, are exactly the ones as in this case, that if I perturb a little bit the boundary data, I still see a very nice free boundary. All the other frequencies, besides 3 half, like 3, 4, or 7 half, 11 half, and so on, they are very unstable. As I perturb a little bit the boundary data, I, the, 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 the free boundary uh, disappears, or, uh, or, or there are this um, multiplicity. Um, I mean, it, it can, the, the free boundary can black, break into several pieces. So things are much more complicated if I move away from the least frequency. So you can think that the regular points correspond in this case to frequency 3 half, and for all other frequencies, they are singular points. Yeah? This is what happens in two dimensions, these, these, these frequencies. In higher dimensions, you don't know what happens anymore. You cannot characterize, or people don't know how to characterize the possible blow-ups for the, for the thin obstacle problems. You can just generalize this in n dimension just by crossing them with r, but uh, yeah, what, what you can say, you can say that things look like this up except on a set of dimension n minus 3. This is a result of Foucault and Spadaro, which is more like a geometric measure theory, GMT result, in which saying if, if in 2D I know what happens, then in higher dimensions up to a set of uh, code dimension 3 is more or less, I, I see whatever happens in 2D. Yeah. But it's possible at this point to have non-trivial cones different from this in three dimensions or four or five. Yeah? So some open problems for the thin obstacle problem would be like what are the possible frequencies, classification of blow-up profiles, so these are, I think are very difficult problems. Yeah? Uniqueness of blow-ups, this again has to do with the regularity of the singular set, understanding what happens. Yeah? And here a lot of, I mean, a lot of people that, that worked on these problems. I also have a result about uniqueness just in three dimension and for frequency lambda being seven half. So it's, it, it, it's very difficult to obtain uniqueness of the blow up uh, profile in this particular setting. So this is like a paper that like of 70, 80 pages that we have and we work very hard for just a particular value of lambda and a particular solution just to prove uniqueness. Yeah. Um, okay, so now I'm almost done with this introductory part. Why the thin obstacle problem is related to the classical obstacle problem? So the thin obstacle problem appears as a linearization of the, of the regular obstacle problem at points that belong to this to this singular set, highest stratum. Yeah? So in order to, to see this, you think, let's say that I have the classical obstacle problem. U is a solution to the classical obstacle problem that stays very close to a quadratic polynomial, let's say 1 half x2 squared. Let's say I'm in 2D, yeah? so I'm very close to this quadratic polynomial like this, and I start perturbing a little bit the data here of this quadratic polynomial. Yeah? So when I perturb the data, initially the free boundary for 1 half x2 squared is just a line. Yeah? When I perturb the data, in some places I lift up, in some places I make some small coincidence sets. Yeah? How do I understand this picture? Is to write u as 1 half x2 squared plus epsilon v. v here stands for the correction, for the, for the error. Yeah? And actually you realize that V, when you rescale V, V solves the obstacle problem with this obstacle. So, so when, I, when I try to understand what V satisfies, I'm, I satisfy the obstacle problem but in which the obstacle is given by minus 1 over 2 epsilon x2 squared. Yeah? So, so sort of this plate after rescaling becomes like a very skinny parabola that is, that is uh, constant in the x2 variable. So in the limit, as epsilon tends to zero, I obtain the thin obstacle problem. Yeah? So in order to understand if here I get, I get, uh, I lift or I get coincidence set and so on, 
I have to understand the obstacle problem, what happens in the obstacle problem, and that would tell me pretty much what happens in, in, in the top problem as well. Yeah? Um, and that's why sort of the techniques from thin obstacle problem can be used in the classical obstacle problem to study the singular sets. Okay, so now um, let, let me go for the last part of my talk and talk about multiple membranes. Yeah? So, so far I just talked about the classical obstacle problem and the thin obstacle problem. What can we say about the multiple membranes? So if you give me two membranes that one is pushing up and one is pushing down, like, like uh, I think I wrote over here, right? Actually, this problem is equivalent to the classical obstacle problem. It's not so interesting. It's not so interesting because if you do the average of U1 and U2, if I work with the average of U1 and U2, it always solves an equation. The, the, the average, right, so the average of U1 and U2 always has a right-hand side F1 plus F2, yeah? If I'm in this case, it's clear that the average is the same as U1 and U2. If I'm in this case, then the average is exactly F1 plus F2 over 2. So the average is precisely determined. Yeah? You give me the data, then the average is going to solve the Laplace equation with right-hand side the average of the Fs. That here is represented by a green line. And then this double membrane problem is essentially like a classical obstacle problem in which the obstacle is given by the green line. Yeah? So it's equivalent to the classical obstacle problem, the, the double membrane problem. Okay, so if I look at two, membranes, two membrane problems, there are maybe other, other versions that are more interesting, that they cannot be reduced to the obstacle problem. One would be to say that you take nonlinear operators. In that case, you can no longer work with the average. Or another version of, of a two-membrane problem is to think that actually I have a membrane and an elastic wire that one sits on top of the other and I push one against the other. Yeah? So, so the wire, instead of being rigid, like in the thin obstacle problem, is, is elastic. So this is like a, com like, a, like a combination between the obstacle and the thin obstacle problem. Let's say an, an open problem that I, I don't know how to solve would be what happens if you look at the obstacle problem for two linear operators but different linear operators, not just Laplace and Laplace. Yeah? You, you can try to think you have two membranes that one is stiffer in one direction and one, and the other one stiffer in a slightly different direction. Yeah, if you try to press them against each other, then it's very difficult to analyze. I mean, I, I don't know how to do it, but yeah, that that would be like an open problem trying to understand uh, a, a two-membrane problem for different operators. Yeah. Okay. So now for the past, I, I think how many minutes do I have? Uh, Maybe. 530. Okay, so, so I'll try to, to say just a few things about the end membrane problem. So if, if the end membrane problem, you think you have n functions and they are pushed around. Yeah? So you can try to think I have two balloons and a membrane in the middle and all three are pushing against each other. And then you're going to have n minus 1 free boundaries is like when the top membrane touches the second membrane. So I think I have here three functions, u1, u2, and u3. Yeah? So I'm going to have a free boundary where u1 contacts u2, and another free boundary where u2 contacts u3. Yeah? And if I change the data on u1, that's going to change u2 and u3, so the whole configuration is changing. So this is a version of the obstacle problem is a coupled system of n minus one obstacle problems put one on top of each other. Yeah? What's difficult to analyze, okay, so this would be like a game interpretation. So, so what is difficult to analyze, I expect to have some free boundaries, let's say gamma one would be where the U1, U1 touches U2 on the blue region here, and U2 touches U3 on the red region here, right? So if I take points on gamma 1 here, far from, from their intersection, it still looks like an obstacle problem. Because I have two membranes contacting each other, the third one is far from it. 
So locally, it's still like a two-membrane problem, which is the obstacle problem. But the delicate part occurs near the intersection points. When, when, the, the, when the free boundaries cross each other, this is a place where all three functions dictate what happens near such points. Yeah? So the, the, the key question would be, how do you, un I mean, what happens where you have two or three bo free boundaries intersecting? I mean, can, can I say, I mean, can you say something about the functions or the free boundaries? And so let me skip this, uh, this uh, slide. I mean, again, you can have like, a, you can do a blow up analysis and you can go in 1D and you look what are the cones when you have different membranes, yeah? When you have different membranes, there are many more cones possible, right? In, in, in for the obstacle problem, you just have two to possibilities. For, for uh, n membranes, actually there are three to the n minus one possibilities because for any two consecutive membranes, they can either touch at a single point or they can touch on the right or on the left. Yeah, so there are many more uh, possibilities. However, if you look at all the possibilities, you look at the least energy solution, energy meaning in terms of this vice energy, the least energy solution is the one where all the membranes coincide on one side and separate on the other one. Yeah. And then, well, so, so for example, if you have just three membranes, there are sort of four uh, possible, uh, four possible cones in 1D. Yeah, all of them agreeing on the left and separating on the, on the right. There is one in which the middle membrane coincides with the top membrane on the left and with the bottom membrane on the right. There is one in which the bottom membrane is just barely attached to the other two at a single point, or another configuration where all the membranes just barely touch each other at a single point. Yeah? So these are very degenerate situation. If you, if you pull things a little bit apart, every, everything go, goes, uh, goes around. Yeah? So, the, the least energy is more stable. Yeah? The, the, the more you go up in the energy, they become very, very unstable. And finally, for example, if you go in 2D, these are the only possible uh, profiles in 2D. Is exactly what, what I showed you here in 1D. When I go to 2D, nothing new happens. Exactly the same thing. And what is interesting is that somehow the free boundaries have to be aligned. Yeah, like, like in, in the least energy solution, the free boundaries cannot cross. They have to be aligned, which means they have to cross tangentially. Yeah, so whatever picture I showed you before that I had a free boundary like this and one like this, in reality, they have to, to cross each other tangentially. Yeah, for the least energy solution. That's a little bit, it's not, it's not so intuitive because of the degree of freedom of the problem. Yeah, sort of I had the, the, the problem with three membranes has two degrees of freedom. I can change the data on the top and on the bottom, but somehow the free boundaries don't have, at least at the intersection point, don't have a two degree of freedom. Yeah. So these are things that we proved rigorously with, so with, with my collaborator, who you, we, we pretty much proved that the picture that you would expect, like, like, like in, in general, you would expect to see this picture for the blow up profile one. Yeah? Actually, it, it really happens, not just in the blow up, but, but in reality, the free boundaries are, are smooth. And for, for the, yeah, so, so, so essentially, every time you have some coincidence region with non trivial density, Thing, I mean, the, the intersection has to happen tangentially. Yeah? So, so just to mention at the end some results is that if I have three membrane problems, then if the intersection point has least energy, then the two free boundaries have to be C1 log surfaces near zero. And this logarithmic correction, this log is optimal. So somehow, the fact that the, thing, that the two free boundaries come tangentially, it happens at a very slow rate. 
It, the, initially, you might think that they go at an angle, but the correction mechanism for them to, to align and become tangent to each other is like a, has, takes logarithmic time. So each time you zoom in, uh, uh, I mean, you have to wait a very, very long time for things to become tangent. Yeah? And then if they are of type 2, whatever type 2 was, like, like uh, then they are singular points that are included in a C1 alpha submanifold. And if they are of type 3 or 4, they are included in, in C1 submanifold. So I don't have time to go into more details. But essentially, yeah, we, we can do, I mean, at, at the end of the day, what we can do, we can, we can have some, uh, some regularity for intersection of free boundaries in this multiple obstacle problem. Uh, um, multiple membrane problem. Yeah, this is what what we achieved here. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>